Hello, my good people. Good, good, good morning again. Um, I trust you're all doing very, very well. So you are welcome to tutorials with Francis. Um, Francis Ohimian is the name. I am a sorry. Okay, good. Yes. I'm a lawyer by profession and I feel like to teach. So yeah. So um in our last video, we or what we are trying to do is to have you know a recap of you know the previous video whole session on, on constitutional law one and two. Um we just want to you know do a refresher, you know, for or let's say a crash course i you know just want to do you know a refresher course on this in a very short um 30 minutes max just so that it doesn't become too difficult for you to follow so in the previous video i think we started with um the history of constitutional law i think we got to colonial era so once again before we start if you haven't subscribed please do if you have a comment, just share. You can also follow me on our socials, and I will be glad to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Let's start. Good. Yes. So, um, yes. So I think we well. Let me just start with with, with this part. I'm not sure if we ended here, but it really doesn't matter. So. In the colonial era, what essentially we are trying to say is to try to understand how the governance structure was at this time, uh, at the time when the British were in the helm of affairs. We want to understand how they were administering the state in terms of the executive, in terms of the legislature and the judiciary. And I'm sure if this is not the first time you are watching my videos, then clearly you know what executive, legislature, and judiciary is. So I would not, you know, continue beating a dead horse. I'm sure you know. But if you don't know, you can just put a comment in there and I would gladly assist you. So at this time, um, final power under the executive was vested in the crown. Now, when you say the crown, we are talking about the queen, her so rest in peace now it's a king but at that time was the crown was the queen queen elizabeth um the executive power was vested in her meaning that she was in charge of the day-to-day -day affairs of the state even though she was not in the country and so the power okay at that time at this time was where a country was still say a colony so the power was exercised on her behalf by the governor so at that time there were a number of governors who were exercising power you know on behalf of of the queen so let me ask how many governors do you know if you if you know any any governor just you know put it in the in the comment section and let's check but I remember Governor Listo, you know, Gadgetsburg, it's also one of them. So tell me which of the governors you, you remember and which one, you know, was the first legal one during the colonial era. I want that. Good. So the, the governor was in charge of the day-to-day -day affairs of the state, except that he was doing that on behalf of the queen. Good. Same again. Um, the powers of the legislature were done by the governor. And and really, the, the powers of the legislature were actually exercised by the Privy Council. So in, in UK, normally it's, it's the Privy Council, you know, the National Assembly that, you know, makes these laws, but it was the governor that was exercising it for them. In fact, the, the Privy Council is, is their court. I mean, you say the Privy Council, they are the highest court in in Britain. Or let me say UK, it's always confusing. Good. And then so for judiciary, as in the enforcement of the laws, it was vested in the in the courts at that time, the Supreme Court ordinance in establishing the Supreme Court at the Gold Coast back then. However, whenever there were appeals, so appeals essentially was that so a judgment has been given in a court, you are not satisfied, you think it should have gone in your way, you can appeal or you can protest, protest and say that, well, I want this matter to be heard again. 
That is what we mean by appeal. And at, at that time, there was what we call the West Africa Court of Appeal. I think it was in Sierra Leone. Yeah, I think so. So um, was, there was the um, West Africa Court of Appeal where you could appeal you know, your matter to. So just imagine the matter has been held in the Gold Coast Accra. And now you filed an appeal. How long is it going to take for you to get to the West Africa Court of Appeal? And please remember that if you are dissatisfied with the decision of the of Waka, that is the West Africa Court of Appeal, then your matter had to go to UK before the Privy Council. Oh, sorry, I mean Court of Appeal, not Court of Appeal. Sorry, had to go to the Privy Council in UK. And you can imagine we are talking about um um the 1900s 1910 19 oh no 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 1910 um okay yeah could yeah yeah i mean 19 so let's say from if, if you are judging from when um even the ashantis came in so 1901 so if you're an ashanti and you were you were dissatisfied with a judgment from waka then from 190203 so just imagine it goes to waka and then to UK. So by the time your matter gets to UK and the decision is made, oh, it would have been too late. So that was, you know, one of the disadvantages. And you can imagine at, at that time, transportation was not as fast as we have now. So you can imagine all, all the challenges that came with. But then again, that was how the, the system was at the time. Mind you guys, this is this is just a revision. I, I did a whole two-hour session on this. So, you know, you can go and then check that video. I don't want to, you know, spend so much time on this so now there's we are um it's fifth march 1957 and everybody's happy everybody is enthused because tomorrow is independence guys tomorrow is independent i'm happy yes so i'm just imagining how you know um Kwame Nkrumah and the others thought, or even just being there, that tomorrow, Ghana, our beloved country, is free forever. Yay! So, I'm just happy. <laughs> Good. Yes. So, Ghana gained independence on 6th March 1957, and then we became a republic on 1st July 1960. So, a republic meant that we became a sovereign on 1960 and then independence on 6th March 1957. So yes, we were independent, but then we're not self-reliant. We we're not, you know, a sovereign state. We, we only attend that on um, 1st July 1960 and be informed that at that time, from 1957 to 1960, the Queen was the head of state. There was no governor because Kwame Nkrumah was the head of government business. So Kwame Nkrumah was in charge of, you know, the, the was a prime minister, was um, also in charge of the ministers at that time, the cabinet ministers at that time, ensuring that, you know, there was smooth, you know, a running of the state. Of course, the, the, the queen was more like a ceremonial head of a sort. That, that is how um, it was. Good. So now we are an independent Ghana. Let's try to see how the executive was. So as I've said, the executive power was vested in the queen. So the queen was was there. Um. Yes. Even though the power was the the power was exercised by the queen or the governor general. But guys, understand that at this time the queen's position was only ceremonial. She was not exercising any real power. Because many as at that time, Kwame Nkrumah had been appointed as a prime minister. So Kwame Nkrumah was actually the one, you know, in charge of, you know, ministers and, and blah, 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 and all that. Yes, so yes, there, were, there was a governor general, but they were, they were not really doing much. And because the queen was not in here, you know, the rule of the queen was, was being assigned by the governor general, but as I've said, it was only a ceremonial rule. The, the, the actual power was with Kwame Nkrumah, that is the, the, the prime minister, you know, engaging in a day-to-day -day affairs of the state. Then we talk about the legislature. In the legislature, the queen was part of the National Assembly, what we, what we call parliamentary. At that time, it was, you know, the National Assembly. And the National Assembly was made up of one zero member, members of parliament. So the queen was, was, was part of it. So it, it wouldn't be surprising that when Kwame Nkrumah comes to take over, he will also be part of the National Assembly. But we'll talk about it very soon. 
So then again, but when Ghana gained independence, you know, it was it was right that all matters were dealt in Ghana and any party who was not satisfied would have to go to the Privy Council because I understand that at this point Ghana had gained independence and demanded that the Waka at that time was for um was more like an appeal called for the colonial states so like Buja, Sierra Leone you know all these were you know colonial states managed by the British so the the worker was where we're all sending you know our appeals to but because now Ghana was an independent state it could not be sending its appeals to a colonial court a colonial appeals court so all these appeals then went to the Privy Council I hope you understand this. I mean, I think it makes um, logical sense. Good. So still an um, independent Ghana. So some of the important laws at that time were the um, the Ghana Constitution Order in Council. That's at that time they were called Order in Council. It was the 1957, which said that Ghana, you are now free. And there was a Ghana Independence Act. Um, sorry. Oh, no, okay, I think I'm going ahead of myself. Let me, um, where am I? Okay, yes, and then the Ghana. Sorry. And then the Ghana um, Constitution Order in Council 1957. Okay, so, okay, I'm still, okay, okay, I think that's where I am. So the Ghana Independence Act, the Ghana... Office of the Governor General Letters Patent. So more like the instructions, you know, like the instructions, royal patent. We, we talked about them, you know, um letters patent, royal charter, <laughs> just so many names. So those were the documents that were more like the laws that were governing the state at that time. Now from there we go to Republic. Now Ghana is a republic. On 1st July 1960, with Kwame Nkrumah becoming the first president of the new Ghana. So Kwame Nkrumah was the first president of the new Ghana, he was the first prime minister and the first president. And at that time, we had a... Um, okay, so even with this, I don't, I, okay, this, this even need not be here because it was for the independence. Now, so... Let's understand that now a Republic Day is more of a, a commemorative day rather than a public day. It used to be a public day until I think uh, 2019 when the, the government was like, well, um, it need not be a, a public day. So it's it's more like we, we only commemorate or only, we only remember that day as a day that Ghana became a, a republic. Now, in, in when I was putting this thing together, I just thought let's also touch about the founding fathers. Because I mean, Kwame Nkrumah did not do it all alone. Kwame Nkrumah needed the assistance of others, you know, to get Ghana to be where it was. So I mean, there's a lot of com controversy whether you know these people need to be called the founding fathers. Because I mean, I mean, there's a lot of controversy depending on which party that you belong you belong or which you know tradition that you belong to. It you know, I mean, they have the Buzia tradition, the Bongo tradition, and whatnot. But it depends on which faction that you belong to. You could either say the, um, these people are the big six, or they are the founding fathers, or it was just Kwame Nkoma, whether they were supporting Kwame Nkoma. That is really not our business. Our business is to at least have an idea that you know all these people helped in the formation of the new gun. And they are actually more. And they are actually more. But at least it seems that these are the person that do stand out, like um, Kwame Nkoma, Ebenezer Akua J, Edward Kufu, Joseph Wachidankwa, Emmanuel Bichibilamte, and then William Oforiata. So these are the names that stand out. But when you read the literature and go on, you could see that there were a lot more, lots, lot, lots lot more that you know that helped you know Kwame Nkoma and the others to gain independence for Ghana. It's however unfortunate that you know we don't have you know a female presenting there because I sure do believe that a lot of you know females and you know, sacrificed a lot to make sure that that happened but it is what it is yes so that's it and then so same on the on the on the republic of ghana at that time so we had the the republican constitution don't forget is the um 1960 constitution so the 1960 constitution or the republican you know 
normally we call it the Republican Constitution. There was also the you know um, a Constitution Amendment 1964 Act 224. So as I've already mentioned, at this time the Queen was displaced as the head of state and the holder of executive power. So when Ghana became a republic, the Queen had no authority. She was displaced because now we had a president and Ghana had become a sovereign state. So we didn't need a Queen. So the executive power was now conferred on the president. So under the executive, it was Kwame Nkrumah who was the president and not the queen. So here Kwame Nkrumah was exercising or was acting as the head of state and then head of government business. Guys, these two are not the same, head of state and the head of government business. What does it mean? If you know it, then tell me in the comment. Good. <laughs> And then still a recap. So forgive me if I'm just rushing through these things. So yes, um, the governor was again replaced. I mean, it's no news because the governor was actually acting for the queen. So then Kwame Nkrumah, as I became head of state, head of government business, he was also the commander in chief of the armed forces. And then um, he also appointed ministers and these ministers were members of parliament. So you understand that from days old, Normally, ministers are, or some ministers are from parliament. Even at this time, almost all the ministers were from parliament. That is why now in the current constitution, at least some of the ministers, you know, are supposed to be from public parliament. So you understand what I mean. If you understand the constitution as well, then now you understand why some ministers are from parliament. And there has always been the, you know, the controversy that these guys are already swarmed up with their parliamentary duties. How are we making them ministers? Can they perform their duties as ministers? Should we, you know, disassociate the office um, of a member of parliament from the office of the minister? Should one person be doing the two? We understand where these things came from. It was, you know, from the early days when uh, the the country was was being formed, and at that time the the cabinet consisted of not less than you know eight um, ministers. But one interesting thing in the nineteen sixty constitution was that Kwame Nkrumah set up what he called the um, the presidential commission, which you know um, consisted of three persons. The whole idea was that where Kwame Nkrumah was not well or he was absent or out of the country, these persons were supposed to govern the state with the advice of the cabinet. So, but now you know that the constitution is, 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 is a bit different. Now what happens is that if the president is out of the country, it's the vice president. If the vice president is out, then it goes to parliament. That is the speaker of parliament. But there has been arguments that if the speaker of parliament is also out, would it go to the Chief Justice, well, we are yet to have a situation where all these three are out of out of the, the country. Or, or the argument has also been that if the Speaker of Parliament is out of the state, would it be the Deputy Speaker of Parliament in that order? Uh -huh. But at least we know that from the President, it comes to the Vice President. From the Vice President, it goes to the Speaker of Parliament. But there hasn't been a situation where you know we have to determine whether it would have to go to the Deputy Speaker and should it go to the deputy speaker and not the um, the chief justice? Since these are the heads of the three main arms of government. But at this time, what the position was that there ought to be a presidential commission with three people um, who were governing the state with the advice of cabinet. Yes. And then again, at this point, the legislative power was vested in the parliament, and the parliament was made up of the president and the National Assembly. Understand that that, that was what the system was, because the queen was also part of the National Assembly. So we seem to have adopted that, that is, the president was part of the National Assembly. But this um, president could not continue because of some of the happenings that uh, um, you know, occurred at this time. Now, I mean, for some of you who know of the, you know, uh, Preventive Detention Act where, you know, Kwame Nkrumah was of the view that, you know, certain people were trying to assassinate him, certain people were trying to, you know, overthrow him. So if he felt that, you know, your acts were inimical to the state, then you will be arrested under the, you know, PDA and you could be detained and all that. And, and Kwame Nkrumah was part of parliament making these laws. So technically these laws 
were not illegal because they were made from parliament, but the righteousness of it or the rightness of, the, of it was the problem because they were made from parliament. But here was a case, a law was made by a person just to benefit them or just to protect the person. I mean, it's not my position to blame Kwame Nkrumah. I mean, I'm sure if I was in his shoes, I would have done worse because if I knew there were persons who were not you know, in favor of my government and then wanted me assassinated, I was going to do everything to protect myself or maybe Kwame Nkrumah told I know. And, and let's all admit, I mean, Kwame Nkrumah had brilliant ideas. I mean, I mean, some of the, you know, infrastructure, you know, provided by Kwame Nkrumah are still in use. And unfortunately, the many presidents have not assisted. I mean, I, do, I, I, do, I don't want to delve into that, but then we all know that the many presidents that have come, you know, after Kwame Nkrumah, none of them has done better than Kwame Nkrumah. I mean, this is the fact. I mean, many of the infrastructure that Kwame Nkrumah put in place have still been used by now. So maybe the man felt that, yes, he had the ideas, you know, to make Ghana work. So why don't you, you know, allow him to, to do? And don't also forget that at this time, he also, you know, did the one party state. So it was just a CPP. And all I think I can't, I really can't tell why all these things happened, but it was just that the man had a vision and then wanted to help Ghana. But it seems that you know, not you know, many of us were very, were very, at that time we were very happy of his ideas. Well, I wasn't there, so I, I I can't tell how hostile the environment was at that time, but that was the um situation back then. And also remember that in that constitution it's interesting to know that the president had limited powers in the in in limited legislative powers let me, let me put it that way so he had some he was not only just a member of parliament but then he had some powers you know to make certain laws and all the laws that you know could come through that were right unless they contradicted or they contravened the constitution so so far as those laws were not you know contravening or contradicting the constitution then they were deemed as, le as legal so that that's the point so um i mean for those who know about in Yakutu, yeah i mean we, we, we normally say it was a doomsday in ghana because you know um certain persons were were went to court trying to you know declare the you know illegality of the PDA act and the courts were like well we, we can't do anything about it because it was made from parliament and blah blah maybe there were more to it maybe you know these um, judges you know could not freely express themselves maybe because of the environment i really can't tell or but I mean, on the face of it, it appears to be that these laws were made from parliament. They went through all the processes that a bill must go through before it becomes a law. So the courts felt that, well, there was not really much they could do about it because the law in itself were illegal. Just that, you know, it had certain elements that were not very righteous that, you know, seemed to be um, antagonizing certain persons. You know, that's how um, it was. So under the judiciary, it was also vested in the courts and at this time the privy council had um okay had also been um abolished so guys um so that is that to the republic in our next session we'll be looking at you know um when the military regimes begin you know so this is the, the first republic we're looking at the second republic the third republic and then see i'm trying as much as possible to make them very short and snappy so that it, it doesn't become boring you know having to you know listen to you know long hours of lectures i mean nobody like that i never like that so i'm just trying to make it snappy so i hope you enjoy this thank you very much for um and join this with me. Yes. So see you soon. And once again, if you haven't subscribed, please do. Um, thank you and have a blessed day. Bye.